Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Also you, Mayor. <laughs> this meeting has been called in accordance with the provisions of the Open Public Meeting Act, and that an announcement of the same had been mailed to the local newspapers and to the clerk on the borough docket, and that the minutes of this meeting will be available after board approval and at a subsequent meeting. <laughs> Roll call. Commissioner Lynch? Present. <laughs> Mr. Sharrick? Present. Mr. Casserly? Present. Commissioner Misano? Present. Consent. Commissioner Orchard? Present. Consent. Uh, Rainy. Rainy, yes. I don't think she's here. <laughs> Ellen's not here, though. And Commissioner McBracken? Here. You have a quorum. Okay, actually, we're going to go into um, a workshop right now. Um, the Borough of Belmar in relation to affordable. Oh, I'm sorry. Again. Okay, we're going to go to a workshop right now in relation to the Borough of Belmar and their affordable housing problem. So, Mayor, would you like to address this? I can this? start, yes. Okay. Do you need this? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, why not? Why not? Thank you, everyone. I'd like to thank uh, the executive director for inviting us here tonight to, um, to make this uh, make ourselves available to the board to answer any questions that you may have regarding the uh, the proposal that was uh, given to the director of the Santos on May 21st. I understand that the last meeting, uh, Council Member Rondonero and I appeared, uh, and the board had not received. The, uh, the May 21st letter as of yet. So um, this is giving us a, another opportunity to, uh, to answer any questions that the board might have. Not being an expert in affordable housing, I have asked uh, two of our uh, professionals here to actually answer some questions. The first person is uh, one of our redevelopment attorneys, Leslie London, uh, who has been intimately involved with uh, the borough and our redevelopment of housing. Um, yeah, they can, if you guys want to come on up, uh, and also Jennifer Bean, who is a planner, who is working uh, with the borough also in our affordable housing uh, efforts to, uh, to get certified for the third round. So they're the experts. Um, I'm going to ask them briefly to just maybe give us a two minute uh, summary on their background, like how many years they've been doing this, their experience, so I'm going to turn it over to Leslie just for a very brief introduction and, and Jennifer and then the board is welcome to ask whatever questions you'd like. Does that work for you guys? They're empty now. They're empty? Okay. If you want to use the mic, sure. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Leslie London. I'm with the law firm of Manaman, Scotland, and Bauman. I've been practicing law for 37 years and doing affordable housing for about 15 years. And I currently represent the borough in your affordable housing litigation before Judge Grosso Jones um, that is currently pending. Good evening. I'm Jennifer Beam. I am a licensed professional planner in the state of New Jersey and a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. I have been practicing for more than 30 years and I've been doing affordable housing for the entirety of that time and have been accepted as an expert in affordable housing before the courts in various languages. They, 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 it might be best to just start off with questions. Anybody in the board has any questions? And I was going to just uh, not suggest, but you might want to uh, think about how you might want to incorporate public questions. So that's up to the board. That's how you want to do that. I do. 
I want to, I want an explanation actually, sure. and it might help everyone else. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually, I'm very confused with this whole thing. Um, I always thought when a developer came to the borough with the plans that it was mandatory that they had to provide a certain percentage for affordable housing. Now I'm reading the co-star, it doesn't sound that It sounds as though the developers were, was not mandatory. So does that mean that, hypothetically, I'm a developer, I come to you, I have my plans. Is it up to you, the borough, to say, well, oh, it looks good, but you, we expect you to give a certain percent of, for, for affordable housing. Is that the borough to request that? And it's not mandatory? I don't understand that I want an answer to that. Sure, I can do that. I can answer that. So participation in compliance with affordable housing, even though it's a constitutional obligation, has been um, up to each individual municipality. It's not mandatory, it's up to you. However, not participating creates a risk. So up till now, the risk has not been really evaluated or taken into consideration because you don't really have a tremendous amount of property available for large-scale development. So what you're talking about is every development has this obligation. That's growth share. That was deemed what, unconstitutional by the courts in like 2008, 2009. Pardon? It was determined to be that, that process where every town, every development, I'm sorry, was uh, creating an obligation was deemed unconstitutional by the courts. And this is why it's taking so long. So that happened in what, 2008, 2009, and then there was additional uh, legislature proposed that was also deemed to be unconstitutional. No legislation was adopted. There was a, another five, plus year gap and the Supreme Court finally ruled and created this obligation which is our constitutional obligation. Excuse me, what year was that? 2015. Okay, go ahead. March of 2015. Every community, every town within, in, within the state was provided the opportunity to opt in in July of that of 2015, so you had like several months to evaluate what the obligation was. Most towns opted in. A lot of the short communities, like yourselves, did not because you do not have a tremendous amount of development land. You're not Wall, you're not Howell, you're not Upper Freehold, you're not Manalvin, you don't have these farms, etc. However, you still do have a constitutional obligation. So what happened recently was there was the threat of a builder's remedy lawsuit. So when you don't participate voluntarily, you run the risk of a builder's remedy lawsuit. A builder's remedy lawsuit means you lose absolute control of your zoning. Developers can come in, 10 stories, 15 stories, density is crazy that you don't want and because you have not participated and protected yourself by participating, you run the risk of issues and development that you don't want. And there was a threat of that happening. So the borough opted to file a declaratory judgment action, which is an action in the court saying, we're gonna participate in this process. And that was Leslie's firm, you know, put that together, submitted that, and that protected you from that builder's remedy litigation. How long ago was that? Sure. We filed the DJ action last year. It was excellent timing because we were just on the heels of having a developer go in on this builder's remedy lawsuit. The builders did intervene in the case. 
they are allowed to intervene. So in our DJ action, we have four um, interveners. So they are sitting at the table. The key difference with Borough filing the DJ action is that we are in control. We ride the bus or steer the bus, if you want to say that, versus the builder telling the court what they want to do in the borough. If you had not filed that DJ action, the builders would have gone into court to say, Your Honor, the borough has not adopted a plan. This is what we want to do. And the judge would follow them versus now the borough is in first and we are leading the way. So we're trying to put together a plan to reach our obligation. The obligation, importantly, is based on a region. It's not just Belmar's numbers alone. Belmar is included in Region 4, which covers all of Monmouth County, Ocean County, and Mercer County. So the formula is based on numbers taking into consideration those three counties. So at this point, we've been in court for about a year. The builders are very aggressive. They want a lot. We've uh, fought them at every avenue that we can, but we still have a number to reach. And the mayor and council have been there, you know, stuck from the very beginning, trying to bring the numbers down. Jennifer's firm did what's called a vacant land adjustment, which brought the number significantly down. We started out with around 200 some odd units of affordable housing. We were able to bring it down to 96, which isn't a public number per se, but because we're still working with fair share, but it's a significant difference. And you have to keep in mind for every affordable unit, you have to build four or five market units. And that's where the numbers come in. So you try to not have to continue doing inclusionary zoning and inclusionary projects because for every one affordable you have five more uh, market units. So what happens, it's helpful if you can get credit for other things such as senior housing. That's why we came to the um, housing authority. We saw that the senior units here don't get credit to help us unless they are open to the region. So that's what, essentially. Thank you. Do you want to take a question? Well, we're here to answer questions about. We're here to answer questions about. Jen, question for you. Sure. So the borough received in 2019 a letter from law firm that was providing legal counsel to the borough at the time, that the borough um, was not complying with its obligation. Um, you were part of the, the administration at that time, and I know you worked very closely with the attorney to develop an ordinance, which was ultimately passed a couple months later, that would um, bring the, the town into compliance with its affordable obligation. Now, I realize there are different ways of looking at this, and different ways of um, seeking remedies. But what you're saying is that um, perhaps that ordinance didn't accomplish what it should have at the time, and, and things have potentially changed? Not really. Okay. So I agree. And that ordinance is similar to a mandatory set-aside ordinance, which was the, the, the borough never affirmatively acted through a declaratory judgment action to participate in the process. So what that ordinance did was say, if we can get units, which there are a couple of developments that got approved over the past several years that had provided commitments to five units, not that they actually provided them, 
but they provided commitments to do it, that ordinance was trying to capture units where they could. The difference between now and then is that now there's a declaratory judgment action. We're before the court. We were not before the court when that ordinance was adopted. There's an obligation of 204 units between the prior round and this current third round, which is scheduled to end come January. So we're looking at another round coming up quickly. We've been very aggressive with fair share, much to Leslie's dismay, because I'm not super nice and have been very aggressive with Fair Share Housing Center on what our obligation would be between the different interveners, which there are four, correct? Um, and other properties within 90% of, no, I would say 100% of which are within the redevelopment area. We come up with an, an obligation of 96 units. We can take 24 bonus credits, right? So that reduces that a little bit to um, 72 physical units that have to be built. So the difference between what happened then was we were not committed into the into the process. We were capturing what we could through the redevelopment plan, the ordinances, etc. But we never physically jumped in and were participating in the process. Once you participate, then fair share is at the table. Fair share, for those of you who don't know, Fair Share Housing Center is a nonprofit affordable housing advocacy group who has been given a very significant power by the Supreme Court. They are allowed to be at every table. They negotiate with us. They say yes, they say no. The court pretty much takes what they have to say. So that ordinance that was adopted previously was not subject to their approval because we were not physically participating in the process. Now we are. They're involved. <laughs> They're difficult to say the least. They, so we have this obligation of 96 units and we've been working with these four interveners over the course of the past year. I think it's longer than a year. Not longer than a year? It feels longer than a year. And we have been battling it out with them and trying to get as many units as we physically can to comply. There are 12 units that were captured under that ordinance under you know the prior situation, which we're going to have to battle out to. But at the end of the day, why we're here tonight, and I know it's a, it's a controversial subject, and I'm happy to answer any questions that come up, is that the units that are in this facility, the 50 units, are physically affordable if you look at the criteria. We don't get credit for them because they're not quote unquote affirmatively marketed, which means they have to be marketed to the region. Mammoth Ocean Mercer. So because there's a residency preference, the borough gets zero credit for those 50 units. And so there was a request, and I'm happy to answer any questions regarding it, as is Leslie, to lift the residency preference at least for 24 of the 50 units, because that's all we can get credit for in order for the borough to receive affordable housing credit. The units are affordable, the, the residents are income qualified, they will absolutely not be displaced from the unit at all. There's no, like, to do this doesn't mean you have to move, that's 100% not happening. I understand that the waitlist is closed, the waitlist can remain closed as long as it needs to be, but the request is, can, would this board act in the affirmative to lift that resident preference from at least 24 of the 50 units? Sure. Also, one advantage of being part of the borough's plan is that we can include you in our spending plan to provide financial assistance to be used for rehab and other uh, expenses incurred by the housing authority. 
We cannot do that without you being part of the plan or being part of the spending plan. Also, the DJ action provides what's called a judgment of compliance and repose to the borough. It protects the borough for the term of the third round, which ends uh, July 1st, 2025, which means that no other developer can file a lawsuit against you and your plan is in place. So uh, there's an advantage to having the DJ action. The ordinance alone didn't provide that type of protection. So just to be clear, the units that were built at 5th and Main Street and the units that were converted to the old bank building yep. have zero affordable units? No. How many? So 500 main, hold on, I have this information. 500 main have two units or should have two units. 800 main, four units, and 10th Avenue, 10th Avenue Associates, six units. You say you should have. Does that mean they are or they're not? No. I, I just don't understand how this, this occurred. There was so much controversy, I know, in the bank I, I agree, and that predates the two of us, so like we... You know, it, it's really... It, but that's it's gross say, negligence. That's not to say that we're not going to go after the units. We are going after the units, and the developer is going to ultimately have to provide them. It's just going to take a while to get to the litigation, but it's not something that the borough is not going to is not going to pursue. We are pursuing it. He is going to have to provide those units. Okay. And for argument's sake, let's suppose the board does decide to for the twenty-four units. Yes. Does that mean the other twenty-six units they could have a preference? Yes. They could. Yes. So locals would have a preference. Hundred percent. Yes. And my final my final question is. If it goes for the 24 units, if it goes into this region four, uh, is it a normal process where you begin at the top of the list and go down? There's going to have to be a lottery. That's what I thought. Okay. Nobody ever brought that up. I understand. That's the, that's the requirement. I totally understand. I, but I, I don't want to mislead you. That would be what was is required is a lottery. And, and that would be administered by the borough's administrative housing agent that has to be hired. Also, it doesn't change your admission and occupancy policy and all of your requirements that are in here for your residents. That will not change. Well, we, do, we basically lose control yeah. on intake. Or the 24 but by uh, a lot of I mean, the short answer is yes. I, what I can say, I, so what I can say is this has been a concern in other communities that I work. There are ways to somewhat mitigate it because when you have the lottery, the people have to have 100% of their paperwork in line before they get put into the criteria. The administrative agent. But what I have seen in other communities, let's say, hypothetically, how we theoretically have meetings with local residents to get their paperwork in line so when things open up, they're 100% ready to go, as opposed to those that perhaps don't live in the community. It's not 100%, but there's ways to help it. I cannot believe you're actually saying this. There you go. Good job. <laughs> I mean, it's a real, it's a reality. I just cannot believe you are saying that that that's your your recommendation. That that's what we could. Do that's not my recommendation. To get around what is already a dumb idea. But but yes, come on. Uh, respectfully. No, respectfully. No, respectfully. I'm not addressing you. I'm addressing them, and we can go at it whenever you want. I'm fine with it. But my point is, is that you you do technically have to have a lottery. You can help your residents get their paperwork together to give them an advantage in the lottery. But other than that, 
And it's important to remember that you will have a uh, administrative agent who is now required under the new legislation to be certified and they have to follow specific procedures. So um, your administrative agent is, is the borough's person that they would hire and that agent will set up the program for, you know, the, um, for the region, who, who from the region will qualify on this. Another one. Well, the salaries can come out of the trust fund. Your trust fund, um, the, uh, the, the, the borough does have a trust fund. It can't be used until we complete the DJ action. We can't use it until we have an approved spending plan. How much is that? I believe there's around 63,000 in it currently. It will be going up. Part of our proposed settlement is to receive money specifically from some of the developers that will be used for rehab and other purposes. Significant amounts of money. No, and citizens who build cabinets in their house. That's right. Um, you know, on the home page of our website for the Belmar Housing Authority, it clearly says that the Belmar Housing Authority's mission is to provide safe, affordable, and clean housing to the residents of Belmar. So this is a drastic change for this community and a housing authority that has been loyal to serving its residents for decades. Um, I do have a question about the distribution of these funds, which I realize are, are minimal. Frankly, in the overall scheme, not going to make any impact in improving the, or the quality of life of the residents that live here. It's minimal right now. But in the ordinance that uh, was passed, ordinance number 20, 23, 14, states in that the expenditure of all funds shall conform to the spending plan approved by COA or court competent jurisdiction. Funds deposited in the Housing Authority Trust Fund may be used for any activity approved by COA or the court address Belmar's fair share obligation. So we have a letter from the administration saying that if we were to adopt this change and no longer prioritize Belmar residents and have this region of Monmouth, Mercer, and Ocean County, we would have access to these funds. But the way I read this ordinance is that, um, or that the borough would have the authority to grant us these funds for improvements that um, may be needed. But the, the way I read this, it says that's not the case. The mayor and council can't do that, that uh, it's done by COA or court of competent jurisdiction. So can you explain how that would work? First of all, the ordinance that you're reading from will be superseded by another ordinance. Part of our DJ action requires the municipality to adopt a group of ordinances, which are pretty standard. The spending plan is part of our DJ action. It's part of our settlement with Fair Share Housing and the court master, court adjudicator now. And the spending plan is created by the borough. So it will be approved by the court. COA is gone. The new legislation dismantled COA. Um, so COA is no longer in existence. The court has jurisdiction right now, and then the forefront changes a little. But right now, Judge Grosso Jones has jurisdiction over the DJ action. And the borough is preparing through Jen's firm the spending plan, and we, we, we decide what goes into it. And that plan will go to the judge as part of our settlement. She will approve it, and that will be in, in 
be forced, you know, going forward. It can be amended whenever, just going back to the court. However, the borough controls how the money is spent. There are some codes that say certain percentages have to be spent doing certain things, but the borough will craft the spending plan. Thank you for that clarification. Oops. Yeah, just um, I have a, a several questions, but I think you know one of the things that I think we just need to keep in mind here as commissioners is uh, is you know our role in the position that we've been appointed to, and I see how costs in this town are rising dramatically. We have apartments on Main Street that are getting $2,800 a month in rent, up to $3,200. Um, and I know that we have a lot of seniors who live in various areas of the town in apartments who are receiving pretty drastic increases monthly to their rents already. And my concern is as the costs in town rise, we're going to have more of our own citizens that are going to need access to the safe, affordable, and clean housing because they're going up dramatically. And if we dilute their ability to be able to access that, I think we're doing a disservice to the people who live here who deserve to be able to move in. I understand that the borough is in a very difficult situation. And we can sit here all night and finger point about who did this right, who did this wrong, and this strategy was better than this or that. But the fact of the matter is what we're really talking about here is the ability of Belmar residents to be able to access safe, clean, and affordable housing to this building. And I know that that will be greatly reduced by the tens of thousands of new people that will be eligible to go on this list. And I do not think that we should, um, I don't think we should put, uh, diminish the ability of our residents to access this building. That's just my philosophical opinion. Now, as far as the affordable, I'm, I'm not denying that the town needs to do this. And I know that there's, you know, four developers and there's probably others who want to do stuff. You know, I think they should be required to include in their unit counts a higher percentage of the, they're going to build the units anyway. Right? If they build 100 and they have to build 17 affordable, they're going to do it. They, they're going to build 100 and they're going to put in 21 affordable, they're going to do that. It's not going to make a bit of difference to them. The unit count is going to remain the same. It's not going to be less units. So why not just say to them, hey guys, this is your obligation. You've got to do this. Um, and I, I don't think we should put it on the backs of the, of the folks who need to access housing. In response to that, each developer is required to give a high percentage of towards affordable. The problem is when you ask or require more affordables. They're happy to do that. However, they want to go up. They want to put more units in. So you're faced with that choice of do we get more affordables from them and just build higher units, you know, instead of 100, do we give them 200 so they can give us more affordable? That's what we've been toying with, to keep the uh, buildings low and to maximize the number of affordable units coming out of it. So the developers are very happy to give more affordable. On the other hand, they're going to want to go up. And I just want to say, I understand what you're saying, that there are people that are renting, etc., that need this affordable. In order for the borough to take credit for an affordable unit, let's say it's an accessory apartment on a piece of property, the homeowner has to be restricted for 30 years. And the occupant has to be income qualified. So... We can't just create affordable rents. There are definitely steps that have to happen. And what we've seen is no one's stepping forward to deed restrict their garage apartment for 30 years for a much significant reduced rent than they could get currently. And that's been 
the battle that we've been dealing with up and to that's that. my exact point, right? So things are getting more expensive, so there's going to be more of a demand for residents in Belmar to access this building. And if we move to get... I, I, I get it. I understand. A hundred percent. I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm just giving you the information mm -hmm. that what we're dealing with one way or the other by participating in the DJ action. That's all. I don't want to dominate the conversation. I would like... Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Just ask that you add, talk one at a time. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Well, it seems the only concern here is the developers suing us. Is that an issue? They're not suing us now. But okay, but they 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 do all these communities. In other communities that have not actively opted to participate, yes, they have. And have they won? Yes. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Can when you ask a question, please give your name and, and what town you reside in. My name is Arlene Napel. I've been in Belmar for over 35 years. I've paid between $20,000 and $40,000 a year taxes, depending on the amount of properties that I had owned. I've lived through Mayor Pringle which I remember when you said if you gave your back house that had no heat, you'd let them have heat if it could be an affordable unit. And our wonderful new mayor, we didn't want the Belmar Inn to become 24 units, 54 feet high. Um, I'm disgusted that they promised 5th and Main, 8th and Main, and 10th and Main have promised affordable housing mm -hmm. units and they haven't. They should be fined. Thank you. And let yes. me tell you, $3,000 to $3,500 a month rent there. Um, I'm, I'm appalled that they can get away with this. Um, I know that the town recently, the past few years, gave up the first aid building and three beautiful $2 million houses were built, which have all were built and sold. So the rich get richer. Um, I'm disgusted that the Belmar Inn is going to become 24 units. I would love for our new mayor to eminent domain the Belmar Inn and just build there. I know people love this Belmar Arts Council. But take that parking lot and that art center. I'm, I'm sorry, let them fight like we're fighting here for the senior building. Build 24 units there. Let us be done with this threat over our heads. Yeah, I if I wanted to live in Beverly Hills, California, in a $15 million mansion, I couldn't because I can't afford it. Why can somebody come to Belmar that can't afford it? It makes no sense to me. But you know what? Mount Laurel, whatever, how this whole thing got started where people deserve affordable housing, they do. The seniors in town deserve this building. Thank you. I yes. have dear and wonderful you. friends here and the building is nicely maintained and there's no crime, there's beautiful laundry room, beautiful break room. There's no reason for you to take 24 units from these people Thank you. that need it. Thank so, you. Thank like you, I said, if you, you can think of another, oh, I don't want to take away that part because we walk our dogs there, but any open property that's near the tracks, maybe the recycling center, put the recycling center off to wall, but build the units here in town and leave the senior building alone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is it only limited to new construction? The, the 96 unit obligation is new construction. There's also a 60 unit rehabilitation obligation on top of that, separate and apart. But what that's about, over the what about the complexes support. that have been no, sold? No, that's here. What about complexes that have been sold and now they're renovating and upping? If they're not deed restricted, we don't get credit for them. They have to be deed restricted and the occupants have to be income qualified. That's the concern. So in their new, when they buy these new complexes, the town can't say, and by the way, you need to have X amount of affordable housing in here? We can't force a private entity to participate in the process. You can force us. I'm not forcing anyone. I'm just, we're just, no, we're just here asking the question. We're not forcing anyone. If I may, part of our DJ action, as I mentioned, includes ordinances that we will be adopting. And those ordinances will mandate anyone else building to put aside 20% affordable housing. So it'll be a mandate that's in as part of our settlement with fair share housing and a directive from the court. 
So if someone else coming in after this is done has to build 20% affordable housing. If it's new construction. New construction. But these, so that, these that the White now. House down on Ocean Avenue, those got eight new townhouses going up for a million dollars are going to become, one of them is going to become affordable Three housing. Three million dollars. Yes. Yes. And at the meeting they said they'd be 600,000. Uh, he has the mic. Go ahead. Uh, just, I'm going to ask a couple questions and then. Um, you have to give your name. I'm sorry, Kenneth Pringle, um, First Avenue, Belmont. Um, Tom Horn. Um, so, yeah. Sorry. Um, a couple questions um, and then a couple comments. The um, it says here that. And I don't remember this, and maybe you can point me to a case where it happened, but somewhere it says that Belmar, used to, first page, frequently asked questions, Belmar used to be able to pay other towns to provide a share of affordable housing. When, when did we ever do that? We didn't because we were never fully participating, but that, op that option was so, so eliminated in 2010. So it's wrong. We never did that. We never did right? it. Right? What we did, actually, was we took money from other towns. Correct. We used the money to renovate homes that belong to closely seniors. Can't hear you. We, we use it to renovate homes that belong mostly to seniors because they didn't meet the criteria to be habitable housing in our town. So it, it um, provided um, weatherproofing, provided new furnaces, more efficient things to make it easier and cheaper and nicer for mostly elderly people, but, but also low-income people who owned houses, couldn't keep them up got to live in a nice home for many more years than they might otherwise have. The other towns got the credit. Correct. But we didn't care about the credit. Just like when we try to create the opportunity for people to convert their homes in the back. We weren't looking for credit. We wanted a place for people to be able to, to stay, for people to put their mother or their aunt or, or a, a neighbor or friend, a place to stay. And, and we never really worried about builders' remedy suits. Because what we did was, when, when, when I won in 1990, never wanted to run, never expected to run, but when I took office in 1990, Belmar, we had, a, we had a, a thing in New Jersey called the Distressed Municipality Index. And it was a calculation of the pressure a community was under financially and socially because of a variety of factors. And I don't, I don't profess to remember what they all were. What I do remember is that of what, 500 and 56 municipalities or 65, I never remember. Um, we were 54th from the top of that list, meaning we were the 54th most distressed municipality in the state of New Jersey. Looking back now from where we are, can you believe that? But, but, but we were a, a blue collar town, mixed everything, um, and, and I don't remember I remember thinking it was a great community um, at the time, but but we had we had struggles, um, and we fought our way back from that. But we not to become the kind of town where we don't want low and moderate income housing in our town. I mean, we've lost so much low and moderate housing in our community. We're not like a, a town with McMansions or townships where we zone for five acres to make sure it stayed the way it was. That was never us. Still not us, I want to think. Maybe outside this room, I'll, I'll, I'll hear differently. But that was never us. And, and to hear, no offense, but to hear kind of talking about how we can keep it some way that's, that's other than playing fair in terms of giving everyone a fair chance to, to, to live in the place, fine. I have no problem with the preference for Belmar residents. That's fair. In 1964, when our commissioners did what they had to do, and they, and they did it through Congressman Howard, by the way, who had just gotten elected on the big, uh, when, when LBJ um, took over and there was a gigantic sweep, uh, he, he swept into office, he had an office in town, he delivered uh, the funding that we needed to make that HUD project go. And it was designed to help our seniors. We did a whole urban renewal project in that period of time. That, that cleared a lot of this, what had been really, really run down housing near the train station, all the stuff around you that you enjoyed, and it's having a renaissance, by the way, you can't even get a parking lot, on, a parking space on a Saturday night. That was all from that era. But it was designed 
to help Del Mar people. Mm -hmm. It was designed to create a place for seniors to go, so so they didn't have to move out of Belmar when they got too too old or couldn't afford to keep their homes anymore, and it's worked magnificently. It really has, and I think anything that changes the character of that, and, and this is I think what bugs me the most about this idea, is that it's it's a gimmick. Nothing's going to happen. Yeah. You, you you have you, you, the turnover here is so slow that by the time 24 units are occupied by people from Middlesex County or Ocean, or o, is it Ocean Monmouth and Middlesex County? No, Ocean Monmouth and Mercer. Oh, Mercer, better. Bur better. Not, not Ocean. Um, so by the time that happens, most of us aren't going to be here anymore. I don't mean just in the building. I don't mean here anymore, right? So, so I don't really get what this is except a gimmick to get out of meeting what really is legitimately our fair share of, of, of making sure that people who have low and moderate income, and, and it's 90 people, 90 units, God forbid that we should have 90 units of, of housing for people who meet these this financial criteria, which by the way, not, not I mean, there's a lot of people I know who, who, would, who would meet this, and I would love to have as neighbors. Some of them I think I already do have as neighbors. So um, I, I, I think, this is, I mean, I, and I hope, Mayor, this is a, a, a we're going to try every single thing possible before we, you know, submit to 20 units per, per developer or hire, whatever. Um, but this is just not us as a community. Uh, and I, I want to say one other thing. And I kind of want to go back to the history of the soup because it's not how I remember this, the little bit that leaked out. And it wasn't, there was never really much transparency on this. I'll, I'll give you credit, Mayor. It's been more now, although more recently now. Um, but I dealt with developers here. We, we started the redevelopment plan. Uh, it was a much more modest concept when we began it. I was just hoping to get some of these places, you know, renovated a little bit. Um, but none of the developers ever threatened a builder's remedy suit that I can remember until this mayor, mm -hmm. right? Not once. And that's why no one had to do anything, because it was never an issue. It was only, no offense to the council members who were here, who were part of that, but it was this no to, re to redevelopment at all thing that shut the door, and then actions that didn't, weren't, didn't, weren't, wasn't there an ordinance done that, that limited the height of buildings in the redevelopment? Yeah. So it wasn't that you would now have to give a, a story higher to, to, to get them to do more units. They already had that story, that extra story. It got taken away from them when this administration took office. So, so we, we get it backwards in terms of how this played out. We're in this jam because you guys took a super tough, no development, no redevelopment, position. Yeah, it is. You can shake your head all you want, Mayor. But that's what happened. So, so, and I'm not saying you shouldn't have been tougher. I think that it's outrageous that the developers have done such so little, either required to do, or, or, or ultimate, or permitted, or I'm sorry, required to set aside in their buildings, and certainly required to the extent they didn't comply with their obligations once they had those to do. And I don't know where the ball got dropped, whether it was on the government side or on the developer side, but that's wrong. Um, but to, 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 I don't want to make this all seem like it's, you know, you're, we're going to rescue things by, by this DJ action. It, it's kind of like, it kind of threw the ball in the air and it's, and it's coming down, this is the only recourse we have. But, but to, to put it on the backs of this building, to, to, to make these folks worry about what the future holds for them yeah. here is just wrong. I mean, there's just no basis for that. So, all right, so do, do please vote tonight just to put an end to this. We'll find the unit someplace else. It doesn't have to be here. But, but these folks, our community deserves better than that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
we are faced with the circumstance that has occurred over the last several years. Funding for is easy to do. I'm going to ignore that at this point. I want to ask, what is the liability and the responsibility and consequences, really, for these builders who have not come by? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What? It's, it's we're, one we're in, Okay, here. We're in the middle of this as a board, as a residential area, and a community, and I don't see a representative of you say I certainly welcome your response of at least one and maybe more. Where does it fall at? This this is an onus that's on our community. It's causing a great deal of uh, interest and concern. I I find it very difficult to have to understand and. and Take into consideration nothing. There is nothing that can be done. No, no that's, not what we, that's not what we're saying. Oh, thank you. That's not what we're saying. And it's one builder. It recently came to our attention and we immediately filed a notice of default with this one developer. And we intend to fully pursue it uh, through litigation if necessary to force those 12 units. That is the response we want to make. As we move along, Jim, I think that it may be. And from what I hear from these two lovely ladies, it seems that they'll be pursuing that for the good of our community. Yes. Maria? Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to go back to um, the more practical issue of how do you have a, a split building? Or I don't even know how that works. If you have some of the units fall under one uh, process application and some units fall under another, um, do, you, do they have to be unit specific? Is that what you're saying? So, I mean, it just, just in terms, yeah. I think they would have to be unit specific. Yeah. Yeah. The occupants of those units would, under no uncertain terms, have to leave okay. at all. Yeah, no, but yes, I think yeah. that. Sh and I'm not advocating one more of the other guys. I'm really not. But if the board were the, to to vote in the affirmative, we would have to identify specific units. Only when that unit became available would it have to be affirmatively marketed through the administrative agent. So there will be. You're right. There will be two separate processes that would have to take place. One would be managed to the administrative agent, and the other would continue to be managed to the housing authority. Yeah, and I think that's, that would cause great confusion. I understand. Not I only for management, which is I 100% understand. The, the least of the problems, but also for the residents. I not understand. knowing exactly who, who's in charge here, uh, I, I think would cause some serious issues. So, I, I totally understand. And I also want to uh, kind of echo what uh, former Mayor Pringle said about uh, well, the waiting list we have now, um, it's all well and good to say, I, I guess what would happen, the waiting list would go bye-bye, is that what you're saying too? So, we have a, let's just say, for, I, I don't know what it, do you know what the waiting list, how many people? So there's 83 people on the waiting list now. What happens to the waiting list now, which is it predominantly uh, residents from Belmore? Or, no, no, oh, okay. 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 The waiting list was from... November 2019 to June of 2020, right. and we closed. Right. So what happens to that waiting list? Because I have a fair housing issue if you're going to say to me, I hope you're not going to say to me, it goes bye-bye. And that's what you're going to say to me. I think it should stay, <laughs> and then anybody new would be added to a new wait list separate and apart. That would be my recommendation. Okay. Ultimately, but is that, is that, but is that what ultimately, anything that we say has to get approved by the court. Like, we don't have the ultimate decision making, okay. but that would be our recommendation. Considering that they've been on the wait list right. that, since that 2019, it would be wholly unfair, especially considering they're not Belmar residents, correct? So it's not even like the residency preference is being taken into consideration with that wait list. I think we could make the argument. But it is by date of application and preference. That would be, and then anybody new would be in a different category. That would be my recommendation. If you guys decide that this is what you want to do, which I'm getting the vibe that may not happen, but I'm just saying that we would work 
as hard as we could to make you as comfortable as possible. If this is something you want to do. If it's not, that's fine. We'll go back to the court and tell the court this is non this is a non starter. We're not here to put pressure on you in any way, shape or form. We're just asking. That's it. Okay. Actually, this is a very small community. I think we're seventy five hundred. And I think everyone that's in here, because we're a local and, and we've kept it local, is very confident. They feel very comfortable with each other. They either know each other or they know somebody that knows us. And they're all very, very comfortable with each other. And I just don't think it would work the other way. I understand. That's, that's just my final I totally, say. I totally understand. Anybody else? Mayor. I just wanted to say, in conclusion, really, the, the whole point of tonight is really is not to persuade. Right. As they have said, it's really to provide information to the board. Okay, I don't want anyone to come out of this and say, well, the mayor and council are trying to force the housing authority to do this or that. That is not the intention. Okay, the intention is, you know, you could have a little extra money, we could pick up 24 units, that would be a win-win. If we don't get the 24 units, that's fine. Okay, the borough will survive, will meet our obligation one way or the other. Okay, it, it's not uh, it's not something that we absolutely must have. Right, we can build a building for 24 units, which will cost multi-million. We have to give the land, it will cost the borough millions of dollars to do that. Or we can, you know, through the process of, you know, again, permitting builders to build in town, we would have to build 160 units at a 50% share to come up with 24 units of affordable housing. So we will do what we have to do, right? There is no pressure to do this. It is your decision to do it. It's your decision, right? Absolutely. In fact, what we're going to do is, if there are no more questions after this, I'm going to suggest that we leave the meeting so that you can discuss it one way or the other. But I want to say it again. We are not here to persuade, okay? We are here to provide information. I'm a little disturbed that the board attorney is not here because I don't know where you get your legal, you know, uh, advice from. But we went the extra mile. We brought our attorney and our planner here to answer any questions that you might have. Again, we're just telling you how it would work. We're not looking for you you know, to twist arms to do that. Right? It's your decision. If it's no, that's fine. We will still work as much as we can to help the Illinois Housing Authority. And I will say one thing, though, through affordable housing, once we do get units built, it will help people stay in town. You know, it will help people who are policemen and firemen and young professionals, and whatever, have that affordability to, to live in Belmont which we don't have at this point, okay? So, um, again, if there are no other questions, I'm going to suggest that we leave and that we open it up. He's got one, one more uh, question. One more. One, more one more question. One more question. Real quick, can we just make the builders that are wanting to do project in town, everyone? We are. We are. We are. It's only 24 years. Why can't we get builders to build 24 years? And I'll just, and I'll just, I'll just, Mayor Pringle's question about why they never got builder remedy suits. Because no one ever wanted to build something more than three and a half stories. The first week I became mayor, a builder came up to me and said, I'm going to build a six story building over there. I have the plans. I saw them on my desk. And I said, Guess what? It's not going to happen. And guess what would have happened? Builder remedy suit. We didn't move fast enough. So the reason why you didn't have one is because no one wanted to go higher. But now, the economy being what it is, you know, we had to do this because they were on our tails. We were seeing building, we had a four-story building on 9th Avenue. The trend was up, 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 and up. So we had to do something to try to cut that trend off. Okay? What, are you, what are you calling a four-story building? 10th and Main is four stories? 9th and Main. I'm sorry, 9th and Main, and Main is? I, I didn't mean 10th. Did I say 10th and Main? That was a mistake. It's not 10th and Main, I'm sorry. 10th Avenue Railroad is four stories. Yeah. But you're only counting the living space, not the 
I, I miss your point. I'm missing your point. You said no one ever did more than three and a half stories, and I'm telling you, of course they did. Yeah, that was only last year, and the year before. What's the data use of this? Well, they weren't in the they were not in the seaport redevelopment zone. Oh, okay. oh so they no. didn't even need to be in the seaport redevelopment zone to build. I can't be responsible for yeah, things that I wasn't in charge of. No one went above three and a half stories before you, and that's just not true. They didn't go to six. Oh, well, well, really, you sound like my grandson. But, you know, you know, it's one of those things where Thank you can't ever know. Mayor, Take care. Clarify. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. We should go. Thank you. Hey, forget your bag. Who's bag? Maria. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming. I just wanted to. Can I quickly? Oops. Do we have the microphone? Can I take the mic for a second? No. Oh. Okay. You know, I just want to say one last thing because again, there's a lot of. Un, there's a lot of finger pointing, and that's, in my opinion, not going to accomplish anything. And it's just a matter of unhealthy behavior. But the Belmar Housing Authority commissioners did receive a letter from the mayor with a specific request. And the letter that we received states something very different than what he just said, and I'll read you what the letter said. The borough respectfully, respectfully requests that the Housing Authority revise its admissions and occupancy policy to remove the local residency preference and implement in its place a regional preference. It does not say the borough of Belmar respectfully requests the, the commissioners of the borough of um, the Belmar Housing Authority to consider this option. He specifically asked in this letter, which was very straightforward, for us to make that change. And that's when I became very, very concerned when I read that. I said, this is not fair to Belmar, and this is not fair to Belmar seniors. Thank you, Jim. But I also want to point out what was reported in the most recent edition of the Post Star by a very well done article that the board, excuse me, Past administrations, and that includes people from both sides of the spectrum, were willfully deficient. Willfully deficient. And the author of that letter was the attorney of the community who represented our town as an employee under a specific regime. And I, the only thing that I regret about tonight altogether is I wish the mayor was here so he could have responded to you in one way or another. And that is indeed the case, Jim, you're 100% right. But I think the issue of finger pointing and trying to portray that as negative behavior, I don't think it is. And it goes back in my heart and my mind to the issue of consequences I brought up before. So I'll leave it at that and say thank you. And I'll pass this on. To that. If that comes, then I'm gonna expect to respond too. If you had your say, I'm going to have mine. Oh. Hey, listen, that is 100% reported in the COSAR. And my first remarks that I made when Jen was here, I brought that up. Because that is 100% true. The attorney did send that letter. The advice that we received from our planner, who was sitting here, and our attorney at the time, who was giving us advice on affordable housing, was to adopt a new ordinance, which we did. That was not reported in the Coast Guard in that article, but we did that. We were led to believe that we were in compliance and doing what we needed to do to meet our obligation. And I think Ken Pringle, our former mayor, was here for 20 years, very smart guy, very accomplished, did wonderful things for this town. You know, addressed that too. This wasn't something that we were ever faced with before, so we were just following the pattern of what needed to be done. But it's water under the bridge at this point. At this point, we need to make a decision as commissioners whether we're going to maintain the priority for Belmar residents and control over our waiting list and admissions process. And as a commissioner, I feel very strongly we should do that. That's just my opinion. I'm only one vote, but that's how I feel. Your waiting, yeah. list, your waiting list isn't even all Belmar people. Your waiting Belmar list folks doesn't, come to the top. Your waiting list doesn't have I'll, all I'll Belmar people. I'll give you this in a minute. Thank you very much. But again, Please don't portray people 
who have an opinion and believe that some matters should have been undertaken, and obviously they were deficient in, in, in substance from what you just said, Jim. It didn't work, that witness, for some reason. Yeah. And let's leave it at that, because we can go back and forth all night, but I'd like to pass this over to someone who will speak. Somebody had a question back here? Yes. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Just say your name, please. I'm Mark Garrity. I'm Mark Garrity. I just wanted to make the comment that you're in a pickle and you're reaching for the lowest hanging fruit you can find in 24 units from this facility. I'm sorry. That will get you out of a jam until 2026, when you'll be in the same jam, and you might possibly, or will, float the idea of coming back for 24 more. That'll get you out of the jam until 2027, when you're going to have to address building up or dealing with the contractors. I agree with the. Um, this gentleman, the uh, commissioner, that it's water under the bridge. You need to address it now and leave this facility for the seniors that come from Belmar. Because if you don't hit it in 2026, you don't hit it in 2027, you still have the same issue. And coming here with their hat out, asking us to make up your deficit just is not the way to go. Thank you. Hi, I'm Maria, I'm your council liaison. I just wanted to let you know that the mayor and council do respect, I certainly respect whatever decision you all come to it. I'm glad that you all came and showed up. Um, I think that that's very helpful that the community has say in what the commissioners, especially the people who are in this building, um, and seniors from, from Belmar. So thank you for coming out. We respect whatever it is that you do. Um, one of the reasons why this did get floated was not just to um, help with, with our, what we need to do for Belmar, but it also was that in towns like Manaswan right now, they have $600,000 in their affordable housing trust fund. And we were told that we could see over a million dollars in the next you know, two years or so. Um, that, that money, a percentage of it, so 70%, 30% has to go to something else, 70% of that money could have been used um, for housing projects here to make things better. Um, and I know that you know, this building, although it's you know beautiful in, in heart, um, the outside of it is it does have crumbling issues that I know you've all worked very hard for. I've worked hard for um, to find funding for, and that won't stop. I, I promise you that that won't stop. Whether you know no matter the choice uh, made today, but I just wanted to put that in there that the, the borough was considering how this might benefit the BHA. And I also I had um, one question after the council meeting, which was, would this affect age requirement in any way? And I want to make sure that I, I address that, which it, it wouldn't. It would remain a senior um, facility. I think you own, uh, you have seniors and persons with disabilities um, in, in the building, and that would remain the same. Um, so yeah, it would be two separate wait lists, but I'm gonna, give my mic up, it seems that I'm feeling the feel. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that I will continue to support and help the BHA no matter what the commissioners decide today. Thank you, Maria. I think we're gonna go back into our meeting now, okay? Okay. All right, can Maria, can I? Sure. Thanks. Hmm. Okay. Sandy Caputo, thank you, Maria. That was my question. Our would this open up to people in their 20s? It will stay a senior building. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
You, you want Mike? Anita? <laughs> We're not done. Yeah. Over here. Hi. Hi. Hello, Rizzo. I've been in this town for over 68 years. This is a building that was built in approximately 1964, 1965. It was made for a senior building. I myself am now a senior. Affordable housing. Is this affordable housing going to be only for seniors? This is a senior building. I don't want to see 25-year-olds in here. I don't want to see 30-year-olds in here. I don't want to see 10-year-old kids in here. It should be nothing but seniors. And if the seniors that live here right now should have their affordable housing discount, they shouldn't be paying higher, higher rents. So that's, I don't know what they're paying. I have like no idea. But I'm just letting you know that I think it should stay all seniors and it has to be, if it's going to go affordable, it better be all seniors, because that's what this building was initially built for, and it should stay that way. Anybody else? <laughs> Diane Wittig, 13th Avenue. I have a, a home in Bayonne, New Jersey as well. The senior, the senior buildings, yeah, that, matter of fact, that attorney who was at the last meeting represented Bayonne, which is now a complete disaster after HUD, HUD uh, requirements came in and they did offense against defense, and it's a disaster it is. But the senior buildings that they, that they promised would stay senior are now overrun with very young people. The, the seniors in there are absolutely terrified. And those, anybody just go to Bayonne, drive through there, Head on to Avenue A, go down to the senior buildings, and you will see what I mean. That's all I'm going to say. And anybody who wants to know anything else about these redevelopments and the parking and the school system and the no tax base, because nobody's going to own these, these rentals. They're all going to be rentals that, that are getting built. So nobody's going to take pride in them. There's no tax base. And you'll understand. Just drive through Bayonne. I left. When my son became a firefighter, I gave him my house. A premarital asset paid in full. I left it. $750,000. I don't want to ever go back to Bayonne again, other than to work for my tugboat company. That's it. Because Bayonne is a horrible place now. And the seniors are terrified in those buildings. That's all I'm going to say. Anybody else? Oh, thank you. Tom Move this. You can't be in front of the speaker. Yeah. All right, Tom, woke us up. <laughs> Let's try that again. Okay. I came here to learn, and I've learned. I don't know as much as you guys do, but I have learned. I want to thank Jim for his comments, yes. and also Bill, uh, your really have the heart of the seniors at heart and, and that's where I'm at. So whatever you do, I know, I feel real confident that you'll make the decision in favor of the residents. That's what we're here for. Thank you. Can we go back and leave? Well, thank you. Anybody want to approve the minutes? Okay. Close the workshop. Close the workshop, absolutely. You going? Bye-bye. Thanks for coming. Everybody agree? Yeah. Okay, anybody? Is anybody going to approve the uh, minutes for the June 3rd? I'll make a motion. I'll second. Commissioner Lynch? Yes. Commissioner Sharrick? Yes. Commissioner Casserly? Yes. Commissioner Misano? Yes. Commissioner Orchard? Yes. Commissioner McCracken? Yes. Have we reviewed the bills for July? And if so, are there any questions? Anyone? Yeah. Anyone make a
a move to um, approve them. I'll make a motion. A second. Yeah. Any reports from the executive director? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you, go ahead. Go ahead. Commissioner Lynch? Yes. Commissioner Sharrick? Yes. Commissioner Casserly? Yes. Commissioner Orchard? Yes. Commissioner McCracken? Yes. In the interest of time, I will just report that, as I stated earlier, there are 83 people currently on the waiting list. Uh, the times were from November 2019 to June 2020. Uh, so we still have a significant waiting list. And None of the people on the waiting list currently are Belmar residents. But explain if that's not if Belmar comes up, they go to the shop. Yes, yes. If someone from Belmar applies, they, they would get first priority. That's all I have to report. What's the wait time? Yeah, I mean, how long is Belmar? How many vacancies do you have a year? You're asking me to figure out who's getting well or not. How many? Uh, How many has three, been this two, once in a while, yeah. once in a while you get a, a pattern of four or five in a, in a short period of time, but generally it's, it's not, very, not much turnover. Okay, any old business? Any new business? Okay, yes, we have to, there's a resolution. 2024-12, the resolution to certify the audit review for the fiscal year ended 9-30-23. Can you take a vote on that? Okay. Commissioner Lynch? Yes. Mr. Sharrick? Yes. Commissioner Casserly? Yes. Commissioner Misano? Yes. Commissioner Orchard? Yes. Commissioner McCracken? Yes. Okay, any reports from the commission? Any more remarks from the general public in relation to anything, a building or anything like that? I just have a question on the status of the bids, the new bids. Oh, sorry. Uh, at the current time, the, the bids are not going out because we're still waiting for a, an official letter stating we received the funds. Okay. So it makes no sense to go out for a bid if we can't pay the bill. Okay. But the bid, the Bid proposal has been changed somewhat to make it a little bit more attractive, economical, and hopefully this will spur, uh, it'll spur them to uh, come in at a more reasonable price. Wonderful. And then I have just a few more things. Um, I just wanted to uh, let you all know that the Belmar Public Library has some wonderful events this summer, and I'm going to give all this if you could put this up um, also our um, fireworks show is on the sixth not the fourth um, so if you want to come at, at us to third avenue beach is actually where it's going to take place but if you stay by the pavilion uh, you'll get a great show um, and anything south of the pavilion otherwise you won't be able to be um, allowed on the beach uh, north of it but anything south so that would be wonderful and then also, I had said that I would um, bring some more of the handouts for the Monmouth County Wellness Transportation uh, information. And so I will need... Sorry. I will leave this all with you as well. Oh, there go my... Too much stuff. Okay, and then we've got Belmar events. So if there is a place... There is a place, executive director, where we could put some of these events and resources. Uh, that would be wonderful. And that's all I have. Thanks. Anyone else? I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's an reference to the elevator. The elevator, by the way, the elevators are absolutely gorgeous. Yes, they are. Yes. But uh, what about the railings? Um, are they going to put more railings in there for people that... Yeah, that's scheduled. It is scheduled? Yeah, they're going to do the three sides. Continue it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Do you know, do you know when? How long? No, we have the elevator in there. I don't know. I'll check on that. I'll check with that. You will? Okay. Yeah. Thank How you. long does the elevator have to be shut down? Yeah, that's... 
they do that within like an hour. Great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much. I'm so happy about the elevator. I'm so happy that you're all happy. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Yes. Okay, everyone, thank you for coming. We're getting into a second session. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.